They disagreed with me. Look at our mood. Oh, it's a good mood. <laughs> Look at our faces. What, we've yeah. already told you we're not going to make a statement. Why not? Why? Because we'll decide when we stick. We make statements. That's perfectly fair. When will you? As the formation of a new centre party became inevitable, Michael Foot begged his colleagues not to go. Right from the first inklings of it, I thought it could be extremely damaging to the party if they left the party, and so. I pleaded with them, one individually and together, not to do it. The one I tried to, Shirley Williams, I thought was going to, her departure was going to be the most damaging for the party as a whole. I spent hours and hours pleading with her not to do it and saying also, in my opinion, that he would wreck her own political career as well as injuring the Labour Party, but still she was determined eventually uh, to go. They were saying, stay with us, you know, we, we think we've got a very promising career future, we think, you know, you're a good comrade, we understand how strongly you feel about the European community and so forth. And I was saying, but look, the Labour Party is increasingly being taken over, it's being taken over by the bloc vote, I can't live with that, it's not acceptable to me, are you prepared to stand up and say, we will oppose these things too. And of course, in Michael's case, they weren't for the straightforward reason that Michael himself very much favoured these changes. So it was a kind of dialogue of the friendly deaf, put it that way. So we'll now proceed to the vote. Tell in January 1981, the Labour Party met at Wembley to vote on the makeup of the Electoral College, which would choose future party leaders. In an effort to avoid disunity, Michael Foote refused to say which formula he preferred. The left's proposals to give party members and trade unions together a greater say than MPs went through. Option six, two million eight hundred. It was clear that the machinery of the party had been totally captured and that the Labour was likely to be advocating unilateral nuclear disarmament coming out of the European community without a referendum and a sort of commanding heights of the economy, uh, a sort of state-run economic policy that was completely uh, wrong for Britain's economic recovery in the 1980s. So at everywhere you looked, it looked totally gloomy. I mean, it is about democracy. Is democracy about giving people a chance to participate, or is it all vetted? Are you vetted and approved, and have you just got to sit back and be, do what you're told? The more I think about this, and I've thought of for many years now, democracy is what is controversial in Britain, not socialist rhetoric. Nobody cares about socialist rhetoric any more than they care about what bishops say on a Sunday about brotherhood, as long as nothing happens till next Sunday. But when you raise the democratic question, then I tell you, you're in trouble. And I've learned that all my life. Not only are you in trouble with the top, but you mobilise mass support down the line. People really are interested in it, and leaders are opposed to it. That was what the whole thing was about, and still is about within the Labour Party. Only after the vote was taken did Michael Foote speak. He made a characteristic call for unity, together with a final, desperate appeal to the Gang of Three. Many of our debates are bound to continue, but let them be continued by people within the party and not by persistently renewed threats of departure. I do not want to push anybody out of this party. I want to spend my time bringing people into this party, and I ask this movement to help us. But the die was cast. Bill and I were both actually physically kind of ill because of the horror of what we were contemplating but hadn't yet made our minds up to. And I think this goes some way to explain why we clung on with every single tiny chink of light that was out there, uh, hoping for a miracle to happen. And it was only when it absolutely didn't happen at the January conference that we finally crossed the Rubicon and decided that we had to go. We'll... Uh... <laughs> We'll do the first and last verses of the red flag and shall we sing it in marching time and not dirge it? Are you ready? The people's flag is in the spread It's shrouded all our martyr dead And the other limbs grow stiff and cold The hearts are dying every fall Then raise the sky
On the 30th of January 1981, the day after the Wembley Conference, the new Social Democratic Party was born. I don't say we're any better people because we couldn't put up with it. Uh, others could. I don't argue that. I do think that people who had held responsibility and se senior government office cheapened politics by standing on their head during the 1980s. And I do believe it was vitally necessary for the health of British politics that in 1981, a group of Labour MPs were prepared to say, up with this, we will not put. The reality is that 10% of the Parliamentary Labour Party left the party and then tried to destroy it and had full media support. They provided a focus of former Labour cabinet ministers who could be used to destroy the Labour Party. That's what, what they did. That was their only function. They never had the slightest prospect of winning electoral victory at all, uh, but their function was to destroy the Labour Party. And everyone who leaves the Labour Party always gets their moment in the sun. There was a moment, I can pinpoint the moment exactly, which was a special conference at Wembley, uh, when we knew the SDP was about to be formed when we were in a shambles over what was called constitutional reform, when the leader of the Labour Party had refused even to speak on the subject at the conference, when I decided it was all up for the Labour Party, I decided that the strange death of Labour England was upon us. And I remember walking from the conference to my car in a car park, thinking, well, here it is, um, it's all over, and deciding that I would go down with a sinking ship rather than do anything else. But at that moment, I thought the ship was certainly going to go down. But the civil war, which had divided the Labour Party for two years, was far from over. Just two months after the Wembley conference, Tony Benn announced that he would challenge Dennis Healy for the deputy leadership under the new rules. The party would once more be racked by bitterness and division. I had a farm in Africa. 